Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of From the Vault. I'm Dan, and with me I've got Nathaniel as always. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm feeling slightly uh, weird about the Pro Tour predictions that we did last week. Okay, I don't um, actually remember them. What did we do? So I said that red aggro would be 25% of the run, and okay. that, like, blue control would be another 25%. And after okay. we... After we, like, signed off, I was like, man, hmm, 25% is a really big number. I probably should have, like, probably should have, like, said something lower. Like, 25% is huge, right? Like, that's so, so many. much. That's so much of the field. So, the numbers came in, um, and <laughs> red aggro was 35% of the room. Oh, my God. Uh, which... <laughs> uh, well, now I feel like maybe I lowballed it. I mean, you did, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Jesus. Um so that's obviously broken down into uh all of the archetypes that wizards broke them down into. Actually I do think there was some logic to the red black stuff. They did make uh that weird mistake with Re- was it Reed Duke and Owen yeah, was... Tuttenwald's list, which are yeah. identical, but they called one red black aggro and the other one red black mid range. But I think that the way they separated them was are you playing Bowmat Courier? If so, you are aggro, I think. Yeah, I think I believe that's how they did it, or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. and and then yeah, mono like, red, obviously. Yeah, then they had mono red. Um, and those those three archetypes of black red, sans bowmat or with bowmat, um, and mono red made up thirty five percent of the room. And then, uh, what was the next biggest? Like blue control was the next biggest, if you can collaborate yeah. with all their archetypes, right? And, <laughs> and that was like fifteen percent. Yeah, and. For that, we had white, blue, Teferi, and white, blue, Control. And the way that that was separated was that the... Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is how it was. That the white... They were both playing Teferi, but the white, blue, Control deck had Gearhawks in it, whereas the white, blue, Teferi was the pull from Tomorrow deck. That's my understanding. Right, okay. Um, I think that's right. I think that a lot of that kind of stuff, like the the fact that we had all these like separated archetypes, it, like it makes sense to me as a standard player... So I look at them mm-hmm. and go, yeah, there is a difference between the the the, the, the decks playing Gear Hulk and the decks playing Pull. Like, in the way yep. you play against them isn't hugely different, but, you know, their play patterns do change a little, and the way those decks play out is a bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes sense from, as, to me as a standard grinder, but uh, I think it's mostly because the Pro Tour came so late in this season. So a bunch of yep. these archetypes were already, like, very established, and we already had a lot of iteration on them, to the point yes. where people were like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, the difference between... White blue to fairy and white blue control is you know these couple of cards that have a cascading effect on these other couple of cards, that mm-hmm. um, you just wouldn't see that kind of like refinement, I guess, between archetypes uh, that are very very similar at um, at like a pro tour that was two weeks into the format. I don't think. Sure, I also think that it was quite confusing because the community hadn't really come up with labels for a lot of these things. And so Wizards kind of took it upon themselves to just kind of label them. And I think they also really want, kind of wanted to use their um, the Dominaria cards in the titles of the uh, of the deck names. So that's I mean, why, that's you know, definitely what, true. Definitely true. But it made for a, a confusing experience all around for even people who were familiar with these um, different shades that you've just outlined. Because we were just like, oh, I, I think this makes sense. Wait, what's this other one? Right, okay. I think it's that. It must be that, right? Um, which was a bit weird, but uh, yeah, the Pro Tour. Um, yeah, everything the happened. Eight, All everything the Chain happened. Whirlers were really good. Yes, um, and the top eight ended up with seven Chain Whirler decks and one mm-hmm. Esper Control deck. With Esper in this case being blue black splashing white for Teferi's. Yep. Um, and then the Esper Control deck, like clearly, what the coverage team would like from that scenario, right, is a finals between. Black red aggro, probably like one of those builds, the kind of more mediumy ones, um, and Esper control. That's what you want out of that, right? You want the Esper control deck to cut its way through all these chain whirlers, and the other the chain whirler side of the bracket to be kind of like you know to have the kind of like the one that makes the most sense that you can sort the easiest out um, to come out of the end of it and have them kind of face off. And then mm-hmm. having the Esper control guy win would be like. The icing on top of the cake, right? Like, oh yes, Chain Whirler was very dominant, but Teferi won the Pro Tour kind of thing. Uh, but that didn't happen. Instead, the nope. Esper Control guy didn't win a single game in Top 8 and got sent home. Um, yep. So then we just had Chain Whirlers from now until the end of time. 
Uh, and uh, I mean, while I was generally actually like red mirrors are pretty skill testing and actually quite interesting matchups. I found um, playing in standard. Uh, it did make for a like a lot of times when the coverage team were clearly struggling to be like, all right, so what's the difference between these two decks? Well, this one has these four cards different to this one and is mm-hmm. therefore slightly differently situated. Okay, well, how does that position them in the matchup? Well, eh. <laughs> it's still pretty close. But they all play Chain Whirler, though. Yeah, they all play Chain Whirler, because that card's really good. So uh, we ended up with 28 copies of... Is it 28? Yeah, some decks. Yeah. 28 copies um, of Chain Whirler in the top eight. Yeah, uh, which is pretty bonkers. Um, another card that showed up a lot was... Um, Scrap Heap Scrounger, which, you know, outside of the um, mono red deck, because there's one mono red, uh, one uh, Esper, and six kind of red black aggros and mid there was a There was a fairly mono red one that was literally only playing black for Scrap Heap Scrounger and a couple of board cards. Right, right. Like that, so heap... there's a lot of variation in your red black lists. Yeah. <laughs> but they're all red black and they're all heavy red. And they're all good. I mean, I I think that I don't know. I, I looking at it. I think I find it difficult to kind of outline which one I I feel is best positioned. I think we were talking about it just today because we were looking at um, Kazuyuki Takimura's, which was the the most mid rangey one in the top eight, um, and very very kind of uh, sort of defensively poised compared to the others with um, you know like. Three, well, he was, just, so I he think was, it was three magma sprays, twenty five yeah. lands. You know, it was quite so. He's quite definitely bigger. he's definitely the mid range variant. Mm-hmm. Um, he's sacrificed his curve a little uh, in order to play um, Vraska's Contempt. Yep. Basically, he's not playing one drops uh, outside of like magma spray, and he's playing three Cinder Barons in addition to the other eight dual lands, so that he can efficiently support triple red. And double black. He's playing two cards yeah. in his main deck. Um, he's a bit heavier on like the the, the four drops as a result because he's also playing three um, Chandras and he's playing mm-hmm. three Glorybringers in his main deck. Interestingly, he still is playing a Hazareth in his main deck, and he, he has another one on the sideboard. Um, yeah. So he's still clearly like on the plan that that, that is a good card, um, mm-hmm. and that it's the best thing to do in the mirror, but. Um, he's planned to kind of, I guess, answer his opponent's Hazaret, um, and like fight his opponent down to like very few resources, uh, and play his Hazaret a lot later in the game if he's going to play yeah. it at all. And this is kind of what we were talking about last week, where you know we're, we're putting Hazaret in these decks, but this isn't a turn four Hazaret deck. This is just you know they're just playing the card because Hazaret is so impossible to answer in the mirror match outside of Soul Scar Mage and a combination of burn spells. Um, and so it's just, yeah, I mean, it's the best card for that. And as you say, you kind of, um, yeah, you, you know, you trade one for one until you get to a point in the game where you're like, right, okay, I can attack with Hazaret now. And, uh, they're probably going to die. So, um, as we said, we, you know, a lot of red decks, uh, Mono Red took the whole, um, took the whole tournament in the hands of Wyatt Darby. Um, and this is a fairly stock Mono Red build i mean it's playing a lot of phoenixes in the main deck uh, i feel like a lot only... of mono red builds have moved towards that though mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but yeah it's pretty clean it's pretty just like all right i'm gonna uh i'm just gonna like play the most efficient cards and hit you to death uh notably it's playing like one less bowmat courier which is like clearly a concession to chain whirler yep. um it's playing like only two on crop crashes, plus let's play three. Uh his spread of um like burn spells is a bit different. It's got four abrades rather than the four lightning strikes that you normally see. And he's only got three yes. shocks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh and this is all to fit in the Phoenixes, I think. Those are the like the additions. And he's playing twenty four lands. Uh which I firmly yep. support. I think that this the, the mono red decks that exist right now are the decks that you can the kind of aggro decks that you can play a few more lands in than you're used to because A, you have um, Hazaret. Mm-hmm. You have like you have Hazaret and Earthshaker Kenra, 
Um, and both of those are good at providing you with things to do with your mana late. Yep. And Hazard specifically incredibly punishes you if you miss a land drop. Yep, that's the thing. If it makes it this... so hard to empty your hand quick enough for her. That's it, and the the deck really has to go one, two, three, four. And if it misses one of those, then yeah, as you say, you can you you know you fall behind a couple of turns of being able to crunch with your stupid indestructible five four, and you you know you can very often lose the match um, as a result of it. Well, it's not even just a couple of turns. It's like you miss a land drop on turn three, and suddenly you're put on the defensive, which this deck is incredibly bad at playing from, and you're not going to get your Hazard online for, like, another two more turns, but, like, it becomes even harder to play out all your things because you're still drawing a card every turn. Yeah. It becomes so much harder to empty your hand if you don't draw lands quickly because your hand is filling up with, like, three and four mana spells, which are all a whole another turn where you're effectively not actually getting more than one card out of your hand, so you're kind of card neutral for the Hazard, um, like, goal of one card in hand. Uh, it just has a cascading effect. Um, yeah. So I, I'm definitely on board with Darby's decision to play 24 lands in this deck, which obviously like looks a bit mountains. weird. Yeah. I I mean, yeah, you're playing Goblin Shame well, uh, just don't bother with... Um, scab Grounds. Scab Grounds. I don't think it's... I just don't think it's worth it. I mean, I, yeah, uh, 24 mountains. Let's go. Um, sideboard is three Chandra's Defeat, which is perhaps one more than what we were seeing in... Uh, the sideboards on the run up to the PT. This is a good call. Yeah. There's a lot of red in the room, and uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of red kills, in the room. Kills <laughs> glory bringers, kills Chandra's, kills all the important cards. Yeah, we have a treasure map, two Ethersphere harvesters, three fight of fires, three Chandra torch, three glory bringer. It's really clean. I like it. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's got the clear kind of go big package of Chandra and glory bringer. It has three fight with fires because that card is good against Lyra. Um, and you kind of need to kill Lyra. It's also reasonable against uh, Mono Green, I think, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. is actually quite a rough matchup for Mono Red, in my opinion. Uh, the treasure map makes sense to me. There's another part of the Keiko Big Package, which supports your general plan. And um, Ethers for Harvesters and Chandra's Defeat are very good in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think I can really fault this list. Uh, obviously, it won the Pro Tour. Um, it was interesting watching some of his matches. Um, his match against Owen Turtonwald. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like a couple of games. I think both of the pre-board games, Owen like stumbled on three lands and was sitting there staring at like heavy hitting four drops. Uh, yeah. And Wyatt killed him. Uh, which I mean, you know, like that's magic. Um, mm-hmm. You, I mean, you kind Especially of felt bad for Owen. Yeah, you kind of felt bad for Owen. We're looking at it and you're like, man, <laughs> you can tell that he's like. <laughs> He's like, he, if he could get, if he could play the game, then you know he could be Owen Turtonwald. But he's not playing the game. Um, so, so but I mean, yeah. if, if I can take any, if I, if at any point I could get my opponent to be mana screwed, if I had like one opportunity to use that in my whole life, it would probably be if I ever got a chance to face Owen Turtonwald. <laughs> yeah. Um, 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 he said he had a really good time though. Um, he was sort of tweeting about it, and um, obviously his squad did well. Um, Reed went down one four. And then decided to just win out, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so I had a twelve four finish, um, and the rest of um, the rest of the pantheon uh, had some decent results. I can't remember them exactly off the top of my head. I know Reed was um, was very good. Uh, yeah, I think Finkel that... ended up somewhere similar to Reed. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, all of like, I mean, all of the it was this clear delineation of like the. Ultra Pro and the like CFB guys all yep. decided to play this blue green Khan deck, which mm-hmm. was medium. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, we kind of people kind of bash it. I don't think the deck's that bad. I, I I agree. I've actually played against it um since uh since the PT on Moto, and it's pretty good. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's probably fine. And like, there was a couple of matches. Where you watched them make multiple seven sevens with Khan, and you were you were thinking, ah, oh, yeah, this is this is dumb. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. We were talking about making big things with your Khan. Well, hey, that's some big things with your Khan. Um, but it didn't do very well overall, uh, and clearly it just wasn't that well suited for the field. Um, I saw some stats actually on this. It had um, 
I had a very poor day one and actually quite a good day two, which is quite interesting. So That's it's fair. potential that it was quite well positioned against the winner's meta game, but couldn't deal with some of the rubbish that it um that it had to face on day one. But uh Maybe. other decks. Um should we should we talk about Grim uh about the Green Blue Khan deck a little bit more? Just briefly, kind of give it an overview. I mean obviously it's kind of an artifact based value deck. We wouldn't really call it an aggro deck per se. Oh um, no, it's not an aggro deck, it's playing Glintless Crane. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh playing uh, four Scrap Trawlers, four Cranes, four Walking Ballista, four Verderous Gearhawk, four Lanawa Elves. Uh, then you've got the four Khans, and then you have a suite of artifacts, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure those artifacts are all amazing on their own. Uh, I'm sure, sure. none of them are rubbish. Definitely. Four Ethersphere Harvester. That one's alright. Yeah, that one's pretty good with Glitless Crane, too. They've been good partners in crime in the past. No one's ever really broken mm-hmm. it. But it's been a really clear like package that you could play of like, oh, Glutinous Crane, oh, find an Aesir for Harvester, okay. <laughs> Turn three, play an Aesir for Harvester, oh, well, now I can crew it with my crane. Um, oh, what a, what a great combination. And, like, that is a good combination. Um, wombo, Wombo. Um, then there was a disagreement, I think, in terms of who, what one mana kind of artifact that draws a card we were going to play. So there's some on Implement of Ferocity, some on a combination of Implement of Ferocity and Renegade Map. These are hard-hitting, constructed all-stars. Renegade um, Map always makes its way into, like, the improvised lists. Uh, yeah, Every time yeah. someone wants to do something with artifacts, they're like, hmm. You can play Renegade, Renegade Map. Map. Yeah, I got four of those in my deck. So exciting. And then a couple of Sorceress Spyglass, which is pretty cool. I think that... um. Tends to answer a lot of the problem cards that this deck can face, namely Heart of Kieran and Planeswalkers, because as we've run through, it doesn't really run any removal outside of Walking Ballista. And a couple of the folks were on Metallic Rebukes. Um, I think Flock wasn't, but um, quite a few of the other guys in the team were. So yeah, uh, the sideboard is stuffed with Vizier of Many Faces, Brontodons, Beasturies, Rampages, and Negates, and Baral's Expertise. So I faced this last night when I was running through a league, and I got Baral's Expertise three times in a game. I'm playing Monogreen. I did, I, that was bad. Did not win that game. Um, so that's, that's Blue Green Khan. Uh, should we talk about the other kind of... <laughs> shall we move on from Blue Green <laughs> yeah, Khan? Yeah, why not? I mean, I, I kind of just wanted to cover it briefly, because I could imagine that anyone that missed the Pro Tour would just be thinking... What the heck is blue blue green con? Even if you have been paying attention to standard, let's talk about Esper Control because that's been um, uh, doing the rounds on yeah. Modo, and a lot of people are quite high on it. Yeah. So the the Guillaume Matin, so Ernest Lim top eighted with Esper Control. Um, there's multiple different builds of this. We also had Autumn Burchett, so shout out Autumn, who did um, really well with it, and the list that. Some folks are looking at the moment as a Guillaume Matignon list, which I find it interesting because Guillaume Matignon's lists are always a bit crazy, I find. Um, but he's playing 28 lands. So he's really pushing the boat out there. Whoa, that's a lot of lands! That man does not want to miss his land drop. <laughs> no, I mean, that that's who he is as a person. That's what all his lists have always been like, and he always does well with his off the wall control decks. I mean, and that's usually, fair. Yeah, usually people are thinking. Well, this is just a Matignon list, but this time everyone's looking at it and going, hmm, this is what I want to play. So, it's playing a lot of Gearhawks, a lot of Teferi. Sorry, let's talk about the list. It's mostly a blue-black control list um, at its core. It's playing blue. It's only playing blue and black cards outside of uh, Teferi and Forsake the Worldly. Those are usually the two kind of um, outliers. Everything else is just uh, Gear Hulks and things that Gear Hulk can flash back and search for as Canter. And the deck plays a good number of draw twos, so Glimmers usually, because um, that plays very well with Gear Hulk, obviously. And uh, yeah, I mean, the deck's pretty good. Sideboard plans involve this particular list has a Scarab God in the sideboard, none in the main. There's quite a few that are playing Scarab Gods in the main. And yeah, the like one that Top Hated was playing. Three Scarab Gods a in the couple. Lane. Oh, three. Wow, yeah. Okay. Um, and then Knights of Malice, because that's obviously pretty good against the white decks. And uh, yeah, I think 
uh, Jace's defeat is showing up quite a lot in these sideboards, and I think that's a particularly well placed card at the moment. I mean, once um, if people are back onto um, Gear Hulks and Scarab Gods and Safaris, then I'm definitely interested in Jace's defeat. Yeah, as it's a catch-all card that wins counter wars and can be used to counter any big threats. That's it. So uh, this deck's interesting i think it's something that's kind of on my list of things to try um we are we, we've got copenhagen coming up which we'll get to in a minute i'm not sure if i've got enough time to kind of um play a good amount of matches with this where i'd be happy slaving up for the gp but i do think that the list is good and certainly worthy of consideration and a, um, a big player at the moment certainly this week in the meta uh other kind of Decent performers. Uh, I guess we can talk about Monogreen. There was a Monogreen list that popped up, uh, which, so I always have to air quote around Monogreen because the Monogreen lists haven't been Monogreen for a while. But the what I was playing last week and what's been doing the rounds on Modo was a, a Black Splash for Scrap Heap Scarringer and things like Hour of Glory and Vraska out of the sideboard. Uh, Emmanuel Gershenson, who is was in the race for Constructed Master. Um, he's a very, very good Constructed player, plays a lot of Traverse Shadow and Modern, and is generally, yeah, very, very good Magic player. Uh, built a list, which was playing blue cards. Uh, so we had Commit to Memory in the main deck, the logic being that Commit to Memory was kind of a quasi-removal spell for the mono green deck, uh, which could answer difficult things like Planeswalkers, but could also deal with a Settle the Wreckage on the stack, uh, unlike... Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I thought that it was a really kind of ingenious solution. Outside of that, the deck is kind of fairly standard. You know, you're playing a lot of green creatures, Blossoming Defense, Heart of Kirins, and a Sky Sovereign. We're playing some weird creatures like Territorial Allosaurus, which I've kind of been testing since and I'm a bit confused by. But uh, I think the logic was... It's a 5 5 Dan. I mean, it's like Polychronos. I mean, <laughs> it's just like Polychronos. The fight is really good. It's a 4 out of 5 that can kill something. When you're playing against Snake and you can fight something, it's pretty great. But the other uh, kind of innovation is 8 Dorks. So it's playing 4 Lanawar Elves, 4 Servant of the Conduit, 22 Land. I've been playing that since uh, since these lists came out, and it's, it's fantastic, honestly. The addition of Servant has really, really um, made a big change to the list and gives you, you know, obviously a lot of mana in the early turns to kind of commit to the board and uh, then you're just holding up Blossom Defense and commit to protect all your big things. Um, so there was quite a few well-placed lists playing the architect, none, none of them top-aided, uh, but a few X2s in Constructed. And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how they were all playing Gershenson's list. Um, there's a few, I think I saw one or two splashing black and one straight mono green, but for the most part, they were all this blue splash with the commit to memory in the main and the gates in the sideboard and kind of all the other well, almost kind of standard fair mono green stuff that we've been seeing um, outside of that, those eight dorks and a couple of weird creatures. But this is really cool and this is kind of what I've been playing since then, uh, just because I've, I've been putting a lot of time into mono green. Um, and I think it's interesting. I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I played a bit of red black as well. So I've got the cards for that and we'll see what I want to do this weekend. Um, what other decks from the pro tour would you like to cover? I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. Actually. I don't think yeah. there's that many other decks. What do we even see? There's a couple uh, of oh, interesting. There was the green white mm-hmm. deck yeah. that Wesco was playing. Yeah. And Willie Adel's team also had... Um, somebody playing it, but slightly different build. But it's basically a green-white mid-range build. Um, again, playing eight dorks, a lot of lands, uh, and the late game is a combination of Shalai, Lyra, and Ajani Unyielding from Ether Revolt. Uh, this deck's got a really good late game, actually. Um, it's playing four Blossoming Defense to protect these kind of big haymakers that it hits fairly quickly with um with this quantity of mana dorks. And then the sideboard has got a lot of removal to kind of pivot if it needs to, some heroic interventions to fight the fumigates, but then you've got, as I said, all these baffling ends, stop to arrests to fight the green decks, Nissas to fight the control decks, and um, Prowling Serpapod <laughs> to fight the control decks. That kind of sounds pretty sick against blue-white. 
Like you resolve snake. it, which you're yeah. always going to resolve. Yeah. Um, and they just stare at their hand of disallows, and they're like, "Oh, really? Wish I could. <laughs> really wish I could syncopate that. Oh, really wish mm-hmm. I could uh, could essence scatter that." It hits pretty hard too. I mean, it's a four three, but I mean, it, I don't know. It gets few. I mean, importantly, you never. Like well, importantly, you never have to attack with it. And making something have to use a cast out or a fumigate to clear something is actually quite powerful. That's true. That's true. Um, so, interesting list. Uh, we also saw Mono Black do okay in the hands of Willy Adel, um, which is a deck that we were talking about a few weeks ago. This is a very different list, playing a lot more creatures. Um, and though it goes by Mono Black Control, really, when you look at it, this is a, it's a very mid range deck. There's a lot of two drops in Gifted Etherborn, Siphoner, Knight of Malice, full complement of Dread Shades, Gontis, Noxious Gearhawks, Lilianas, and a suite of Removal. 26 lands. Um, that's Dread interesting. Shade certainly looks better in a world where a Braid is the most like popular removal spell rather than that is true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, like The ability to just play it on turn four, hold up one mana, and be like, okay, you can't kill it. <laughs> um... The fact that everyone that is playing a braid is also playing a license disintegration is kind of awkward. Yeah. Um, and I did. I have been playing a version of Red Black that plays a lot of cuts, and when they do that and you just cut it, it feels pretty good. It is pretty good. When you eventually um, get to cut their four drop, life's pretty great. I still think that um, looking at things like Noxious Gear Hulk and the like is does look to have a decent mid range matchup probably not as good as the lists that we were testing but I think it's fine can... I one I, I one of my losses uh not to the mirror playing the red black variant I've been testing a lot of recently was to this mono black list okay yeah so I'm, I'm as I said it's got a fair red black matchup um and it's kind of shored up the control matchups with siphoners in the main things like that uh it's interesting uh, so that's another Another um, deck that's kind of doing the rounds at the moment, not as present as... I, I, say, I mean, I think that if you want to play a more controlling list, then Esper is probably better to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Mono Black gets hit by... I guess this version is slightly better against all the hate that hits our version a lot harder. Mm-hmm. So our version was really hard to play because your opponents were all playing Lifecrafter's Bestiary and Shaper's Sanctuary... Uh, and treasure maps and like a bunch of um, methods of generating card advantage post board mm-hmm. um, which invalidate a lot of your game plan and you didn't really have any way of stopping them from doing that you had to just duress it out of their hand um, right. which is hard with these very cheap cards mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, whereas obviously Esper can just be like okay well I will forsake the worldly that or I will counter it uh, it's not foolproof. People still get to just, like, you know, duress, duress, lifecrafters best you you. Um, but you have more outs. Yeah, you you have more outs to those sort of things, and you're not just dead when they resolve. Um, mm-hmm. Which Mono Black always kind of felt like, oh, huh. I'm like, cold like that, to this. I am super cold. I'm just dead. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, um, that Esper is a better place to be, personally, if you're going to be going the control route. Everyone seems off blue-white now, which I kind of get. Um, lacking access to a one-mana removal spell puts you quite far behind in a world where people are playing a lot of Bomat Couriers. Yes. Um, whereas Esper puts you in a situation where you can actually keep up with those decks. Seal Away does help a lot, obviously, but is a problem against the Brontanon decks, whereas that when you're playing Contempt and Push, you just don't really have to worry about that. Yeah, and Cast Down's a very good card right now. People are mm-hmm. playing... You know, the, the big things you have to kill. Some of them are legendary, but those ones wouldn't die to your two-mana removal spell. I guess they die to seal away, but a lot of, some of them don't. I don't know. I think Cast Down is still just a good place to be. People are playing mm-hmm. three drops at the moment, which Cast Down is quite good at bridging between your Fatal Push and your Vraska's Contempt targets. Yep. You never really wanted to be Vraska's Contempting your opponent's three drops, but sometimes you had to because your only other removal spell was Fatal Push. Yep. Whereas now Cast Down gives you this kind of like kind of bridges blind the gap spot. a little bit. Yeah. yeah, and it's very, very good against Glorybringer, which seen a lot of play. One deck that's playing cast down. We'll briefly mention this, and then we can um, move on. Is the Esper Knights deck? I think Steve Haddo had a um a deck tech on it, and Rory, uh, new member of the team, 
So welcome to Rory, is, um, was, was playing this deck for the last couple of weeks, or at least something similar. So it kind of looks like the black-white deck of your, you know, of a few weeks ago. But uh, it's not playing Torcraft, uh, and it's playing less Hearts of Kieran as a result. It's playing the full complement of white and black knights. And then it's splashing blue for Hostage Taker, Scarab God, Negate, and Teferi out of the board. Um... So did you did you see any? I'm not sure if this got on camera. I'm just trying to think. I I didn't manage to watch uh, everything, but it, the deck's kind of interesting. I don't know if it's really got kind of legs, uh, long term. I know that there's. Um, what's your thoughts on this one? Ah, uh, I so I haven't really played with or against it enough to know. Uh -huh. Um, I look at it and it looks like a big old mess. Yeah. <laughs> of cards that people were like, ah, oh, that card's strong. I'll put that in my deck. Ah, this card's also strong. It's not quite in my colors. It's in one of my colors. What if I played the other one? Yeah. yeah. Three colors. <laughs> yeah. Bit of a, a bit of a madman progression. I to think get where it got. three colors is still quite hard to support. Yep. Uh, and then we've just been talking about Esper Control. The deck is much more of a two-color deck splashing than this deck is, I feel. I mean, I guess you're still splashing blue, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like it yeah. impacts your aggro decks a lot harder. I think so. It showed up in fairly big numbers, um, but didn't really break through into the kind of the winner's metagame. There was one white-black deck, which was fairly traditional looking with the tour crafts and everything, kind of a la Jerry T from a few weeks ago and what we were playing at the time. And then outside of that, a lot of these espers, and there was a few white-blue ones which were playing History of Benalia, and they all end up in the kind of six to seven win bracket, not quite breaking into... Um, yeah, I mean, actually, I'm trying to see not too many seven wins, many in the six. So those were the decks of the PT. Um, oh, should we... Snake, let's just quickly cover Snake. Oh, yeah, Snake, Snake. Did, did, <laughs> Snake didn't do well. Uh, it's done well in the PTQ... Uh, from the PT weekend and the PTQ the previous weekend, but I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not gonna. I don't want to sound seems like it's really record. hard to play Snake in a world where the consensus best deck plays like multiple Chandras and Glorybringers, and it's like to experiment with cards like Cut to Ribbons, which that's so, that card seems really good against Snake. It's it's so, it's so miserable because the, these decks aren't even playing Blossoming Defense; they're playing Adventurous Impulse for their toolkit of weird and wonderful creatures and uh, anyway that's snake snake didn't do well let's talk about danny danny did well yeah danny played chain whirler instead of snake so yep danny got to win games to intro introduce danny to any listeners that don't know danny anderson uh plays out of glasgow uh good friend of the team fantastic human and second pt yeah second pt he queued for the first one online, if I'm not incorrect, and then he played a PTQ right. at GP Liverpool and won that. <laughs> and then there was a brief moment where they said, oh, yeah, congratulations on queuing for PT Rivals of Ixalan. And he was like, what? No, I already queued for that one. I would already got an invite there. Thank you. And Bilbao? Yeah, I don't want the flights to Bilbao. I want the flights to Richmond, please. Um, <laughs> you advertised it for Richmond because the, the PTQ had adver been advertised as for Proto Dominaria. And so yep. they kind of like looked back, they realized their mistake, and they said, okay, sure, you've got an invite to Proto Dominaria. Um, so Danny's first PT. So uh, as a members of the Scottish community, we get updates on all these things, because anyone from Scotland making uh, the Pro Tour is like a pretty big deal, especially people who are not called Stephen um, Murray or Bradley Barkley at this point in time. Because <laughs> those guys yep. tend to make... Those guys, they don't make every PT, but they make a lot of them. Um, mm -hmm. um so everyone was pretty excited for Danny. He showed up. He pl I think he played Valakut. Uh, he was a modern PT. First modern PT we'd had in a while. Mm -hmm. Did not do very well. Left early in day one. Um, don't imagine was was feeling great. Came into this PT. Was doing standard Danny things. Of, uh, you know, just kind of like... <laughs> previous to this, he was like, I don't know what to play. I don't know what I'm I doing. I hate magic. <laughs> I hate magic. What am I doing here? Um... Ended up coming in top 16 at the end of this PT. Um, how many wins yeah. did he end up getting? Like 13? Uh, no, no, no. I think he went X4. Yeah, X4. Yeah, he went 12-4. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we got live updates of his last round from Riley Knight, who was <laughs> at, not at that point in the booth, uh, and who is also sort of a member of the Scottish community at this point, uh, yep. and who was who was watching Danny's match and giving us live updates, which was pretty great. That's fantastic. Um, and yeah, so what this means for Danny is Andrew Rayner worked it out, who's another Scottish Magic player. Um, Andrew Rayner worked it out. He's going to get like 13 pro points or something like that yeah. from, from this, which brings him up to 18. Um, which And also he's queued for the next PT. Yeah, no, he yeah he will have been queued. I think you're queued at X five. Yeah, you're queued yes. at eleven and five for the next. You're PT. queued so at X five. Mm -hmm. So he's queued he for his PT. penultimate round, and then going into the last one, we were like, "Come on, boy, you can get yeah. that top 16. So showing up for the next PT will get him three pro points, which means that he'll lock silver. Um, which means that he'll obviously he'll have more invites to more PTs. Um, so this is actually yeah the the, the exciting thing about this for the Scottish community is. That we might actually have someone consistently on the tour, yeah, um, and we just have more good players around, and also everyone's excited for Danny because Danny, Danny. yeah, because because it's really cool because yeah. Danny's a cool guy. Mm -hmm. So he finished fifteenth um, with his twelve four finish, and yeah, no, we're, we're all just absolutely over the moon about it. It was so good because you you get the kind of standings while uh, while there's a break between rounds, and you, you get you know you get the kind of top top. 24 on the screen i think something like that something like that can, yeah, and yeah. like they all have little flags next to their name yes um so there's a bunch of like european flags of various creeds that are not <laughs> british normally um yep. and then there's lots of american, lots of american flags, flags a, maybe a couple of japanese flags yeah and then this time there was one Scottish flag, <laughs> uh, which everyone was getting pretty excited about. Next to Daddy Addison's name, and that was just, it was phenomenal. And so we were all just so excited. Um, yeah, and it's just, yeah, congratulations, Danny, man. We're all super, super happy for you. And it's really, really great to see a Scottish player just do what you've done. That's great. Uh, I don't think, that's, that's the highest finish by a Scottish player, right? I I'm believe sure so. I'm sure that was a... Um, a stat that was bandied at the time. If that's wrong, yeah. it has been a good few but weeks I mean, for Scottish Magic. Absolutely, um, uh, we won a GP. We won our first ever GP, <laughs> and now we have maybe our first ever PT top sixteen. Yeah, um, it's really uh, it's just phenomenal. We need to. Um, we wanted to get Danny on for an episode, but he's currently celebrating in Vegas. So I'm not, I'm not sure if we'll be able. Yeah, to Yeah, he's doing. I think in. he's doing GP Vegas. That's um, it. Mm -hmm. which, is that this weekend? And he's got a lot of money. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think it is this weekend. I remember, um, I think the, the Americans on Twitter are talking about it and packing for it. So, yeah, I think it's this weekend. So, um, maybe we'll get him on when he comes back. Uh, maybe we can do some kind of double header and get, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Don't want to promise anything. <laughs> we'll see how it works out. But Danny exactly. would be a good guest, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, what have we, what happened to us at the weekend? We had the home PPTQ, uh, Matthew's Vault. Uh, which Tim Allen won, so congrats! Can you guess Tim. what he was playing, boys <laughs> and girls at home? Do you want to take a take a quick punt as to the deck that won the local PPTQ? Ah, uh, hold on a second! It was red black aggro. <laughs> I kind of wanted um, to do a drum roll on the desk, but <laughs> I'm was... pretty sure Jared would kill me because I imagine that that would be terrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it was the probably best deck in standard. Yeah. It's a shock to everyone, I know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Tim Powell did it well. Uh, I played against him effectively for top eight. Um, I made a couple of mistakes. Um, but yeah, um, congratulations to Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, it was good to see someone uh, local winning the local PPTQ. Yep. Um, great, great job, buddy. Um, so he was playing the kind of... Oh, was he playing the mid-range variant? I think he was playing I the slightly more mid-range mid -range variant. I'm I pretty sure I saw Cinder Barons. Yeah. yeah, I recall him playing a Cinder Barons against me, mm -hmm. which uh, would tend to imply the mid-range variant. Yeah, I played him in the Swiss. Uh, I was playing one of green, splash black. I went... Uh, yeah, I double drew into top eight and lost the semi-final to the mirror, which is a weird matchup. I'm quite excited to be playing things like commit 
for this, actually. Yeah, Commit seems really good. That seems like a sick out to just, Ronus. Which oh, is like a, that, great. Yeah. Ronus is the equivalent of Hazareth in the mirror, from what I can tell. Mm-hmm. Just like, you can't really do anything about it, and you just kind of sit there staring at each other's Ronuses until somebody finds a way to break the, the stall. Yeah. And whoever's more ahead on life, um, or Galters, kind of gets to do that. <laughs> Whereas yes. in the red, in in mono red, it's like whoever's more ahead on life, or maybe like glory bringers. Yeah, the life just doesn't matter in the mono green mirror. It's just who makes the biggest thing and does it live. And if it lives, then you're dead. And that's usually Ronus or Galta. So game one, we have a kind of I think this is where we have a bit of a Ronus staring contest, um, and then eventually my opponent lands a Galta. So I've got to survive that for a bit. It's kind of sitting back. Well, no, because I've got the Ronus on the board, so he's sitting back a little bit because of the Death Touch. And then he swings, and I'm thinking, what's changed? Why did he not swing last turn? Oh god, he's got another Galter in his hand. I'm almost certainly dead. Kill his Galter, lands another Galter. Uh, and then I find my Galter a couple draws later, but it's too too little too late. So I he believe made... you actually draw the Galter exactly that turn. Right. The so turn he... he plays his second Galter, you draw a Galter, and you're like, well, that's nice. Um, <laughs> but I'm now on, like, four. Yeah, so, there's a heart of Kieran in the air. That was the other thing, because while the yeah. while the um, staring contest is happening between the Ronuses, there's this heart of Kieran crashing in and reducing my life total, and Ronus pumps it for the win. So that was kind of tricky. And then game two, uh, I just have a really quick start, uh, play a quick Galta, kill my opponent, and then game three, uh, my opponent lands a Ronus. I don't have one. Things get a bit weird, but then I land a Nissa, and it feels like I can race him. Uh, and I kind of, I crunch him down to about four, I think, before, you know, his board state just kind of becomes a bit I believe, overwhelming. Yeah, you, you got him to exactly four, mm-hmm. and there were several turns where you have a heart of Kieran on the board, and yeah. if you draw anything capable of curing it, your opponent dies. Exactly. Um, and then, and then the window slowly closes as he, like, draws and plays a thrashing Brontodon, mm-hmm. but, they, but that turn he's tapped out, so if you draw something now, you can kill him. Oh, no, okay, we didn't. And then <laughs> there was a a point in time where he swung all out with all his things and left back no blockers. And you had you ended up blocking in such a way that you put yourself to basically dead no matter what next turn, but that would be true no matter how you blocked. Mm-hmm. Um, and you had a Lana War Elves in play. Yes. So at that point I was thinking like, okay, so we're on Hashif Oasis <laughs> for the win. If we yep. draw Hashif Oasis, we get to kill our opponent. Mm-hmm. And then we didn't draw Hashif Oasis. <laughs> or so then... Nissa, because I had another Nissa in the deck as well. That's so true. That would have been a hasty threat. Um... Hashif Oasis or Nissa. Both of these will kill our opponent. Did not draw either. Died. <laughs> Actually, I still had the Heart of Kieran, I think. Yeah, so... but he had, he had mana up with Brontodon. So... Oh, that's right. He had mana up with Brontodon at that point. Anyway, we die. Uh, oh, no, that doesn't do it. But anyway, we had, a, we had a bunch of draw steps. We didn't hit it. That's okay. Um, had a good game. So a fella from uh, that plays up in Fife. Uh, yeah, I think then... a few of the Fife people came down. Yeah, yeah, no, we had a good rep- representation. And um, I think three of them made top eight? Three of them, I think. Um, at any rate, that was, yeah, good representation there. And then uh, and that fella went on to play Tim in the final. And Tim won the PBTQ. So that was that tournament. Uh, coming up, we have GP Copenhagen. What are you going to play? Um, probably Dragon Skull Summits. Yes, that seems reasonable. I was uh, play- I played a League of Esper Control. Oh yeah, literally today, Dan. Don't okay. pigeonhole me. Don't put me in a box. <laughs> your your box I can't escape from. I bet you had a terrible time. I went three two. Oh, and- good job. I lost one of my matches because <laughs> I kept a really bad hand in game one. I looked at it and was like, that sounds fine. And then I kept it and I looked at it again and was like, ah, this hand's rubbish. <laughs> it was just like four mana interaction and haymakers and oh. lands. Yeah, I went to it. And I'm like, oh, and then you're, my opponent played a turn two Linsleaf Siphon. And I was like, oh, I've lost the game. <laughs> Very good. What, what am I doing? Uh, and then he and then he is the game game two. He went Jurest, Jurest, Lifecrafted Bestry. And I was like, ah, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah, you have it's this you, you got me. You have this um, one. I managed to fight back some quite close games against Mono Red. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't feel like the deck is that disfavored there. Um, I don't yes. know. I just, I just don't feel like I'm going to get enough reps in and be happy enough with my board plans to play Esper. Although I do think it's probably a very strong choice. I'm currently moving back and forth between 
uh, a much more mid rangey red black list similar to Takimura's that he top eighted mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. I've been having a lot of success with it, and I f- the deck's play patterns feel very good. All my losses are basically to just drawing, like to drawing too few or too many lands um, so far, and I feel very comfortable navigating games with it, especially the mirror. Um, or something like Turtonwald's more aggressively slanted build, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm not sure how to feel about, but I need to test that a bit more. I've been putting a lot more of my effort into Takimura's list. Um, <laughs> so Takimura's list, um, like we said, plays less one drops, more Cinder Barons, um, Khans, <laughs> um, Vraska's Contempts, Magus way more, phrase. yeah, Magus Phrase, way more ways of generating card advantage. Um, what I have been testing in the sideboard is a card that was touted to be one of the best in standard <laughs> and never quite found its way there, um, which was Hour of Devastation. How's that been for you? It's been okay. It's not been amazing. It's it seems been good okay. in there. So having more outs to Hazaret is a pretty big deal. Mm-hmm. And there were several games where I was drawing to it. I didn't draw it, but if I had drawn it, it might have won me the game. Um, and it would have been better than Nebraska's Contempt. Like okay. my opponent had like other random dudas around, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and cleaning up the whole board would have been very useful. And it's... I was like blocking with a phoenix or something. Right. Um, and as soon as like your opponent has two very big things, and you maybe only have one or something like that, so a combination of a Chandra and a Glorybringer, or a Phoenix and a Glorybringer, or a Hazaret and a Chandra, just one of these. So it's very not really large... against Phoenix. Sure, it's not good against Phoenix. My my point wasn't necessarily about. Um, about hour there. It was more just about the mirror, where if they sure, yeah. get two of these things and you're not in a position to kind of deal with them, then you you know you usually die very very quickly. Yeah, um, and they don't give you a lot of draw steps. That's definitely true. Falling behind by one big threat can often be enough to like spell doom. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Our devastation is so it plays very well with the way that the deck is built. I think. Uh, in the mirror, specifically. Right. Um, because the way the deck is built, everyone is still going to sideboard in and keep all their abrades and stuff against you. I've had p- multiple people sideboard in a low magma sprays. I've been cutting a lot of my scrap heap scroungers in the mirror. Okay. Because it's not how I want to be positioned. I want to be playing answers and then a big threat. And I don't really want to be playing um, like two mana or two drops that can't block yeah, when I'm positioning block myself really more defensively. Problem, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, but they, but people still keep in all their Magma Sprays against me. So, well, they bring in all their Magma Sprays against me. So, I've had people double Magma Spray Glory Bringers and stuff, which actually feels pretty great, mm-hmm. uh, so especially if it already, if, especially if you've already got a um, uh, an Exert off, mm-hmm. and you're leveling a little bit there, which is pretty cool. And then you can kind of dummy them in game three if you want. If yeah, there is a game but three. so the um, the advantage that Arrow Devastation gives you is that. So that plays well against Hazaret, right? Because it's quite hard to empty your hand when your hand is full of stuff like Magma Spray and a Braid. If I don't give you any targets for it, mm-hmm. and because commonly, like my deck has Raskus Contempts and much bigger ways of going over the top than yours does, so I'm pretty happy just sitting there and waiting. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll like maybe Doomfall them and take a card out of their hand, but I'm pretty mm-hmm. okay just sitting there and waiting, which will commonly lead to them like finding a turn where they realize they have to play out their Hazaret onto a board where they can't attack with it because they have, you know, four cards in their hand, but they don't have anything else to do. Um, so they play out the Hazaret, and then they have to play out other things as well and put their hand all on the board. And then after they've done that, I guess to cast Arrow Devastation and win the game. Mm-hmm. Um, this does struggle against Phoenix. It means you have to, like, end step a Braid the Phoenix and untap an Arrow Devastation it. Um, or be at six mana and also have a Magma Spray. Um, mm-hmm. and- it's feasible, though. Yeah, it is. I think it plays well against glory bringers because, it, it, in a weird way, it doesn't sound like it does because sorcery speed stuff doesn't normally. But often people will play their glory bringer, exert it to kill your chain whirler or, or whatever, hit you in, in the face for four, and then you have this kind of breathing room turn where their glory bringer is on the board, and you kind of don't want to have to expend resources on killing it because it's not going to matter until like a whole nother turn cycle from now. Mm-hmm. But if you don't expend resources on killing this and your resources aren't like instant speed, for example, then like you have a Chandra and you're like, hmm, I don't really have anything else to do with my turn. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or like a Phoenix and you're like, hmm, if they just play another glory bringer, I'm now so far behind yeah. that it, and it's too hard for me to deal with two of them in one turn. 
that I feel like I need to kill this Glorybringer now. So you like play out your Chandra, you minus on the Glorybringer, and then they're like, oh, well, kill it with any of the n- numerous ways I have of killing a Chandra that's on one loyalty. Mm-hmm. Um, and you played four mana cut, gain a little bit of life. Yeah, and you played four mana cut, like gain one to three life. Mm-hmm. Um, so our decision kind of plays okay against that because you can afford to not deal with glory bringers that are exerted if you have arrow of devastation because then you can just arrow of devastation them and that'll clean up the glory bringer that's on the board. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it also gets a lot of points in the mirror because people aren't really expecting it. Nobody's playing around a wrath. Yeah. So everyone just puts everything they have on the on the table and then you get to blow it all up. Um, I also think it should be good against mono green. Um, again, it has a slightly um, unexpected factor. Mono green isn't really prepared for a wrath. Uh, Definitely. And it kills... Or at least not out of red black. And it kills everything that isn't Galta, really, yep. realistically. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can time it correctly, then it will just... Um, strand the Galtas in their yeah, hand. Yeah, strand the Galtas in their hand. It kills the Ronus. That's that's really good, actually. Yeah, killing the Ronus is a really big deal. It doesn't kill Heart of Kirin, but I don't think the deck is that soft to Heart of Kirin, so I think you can afford to yeah, you're the not have deck. your sweeper kill it. Yeah. Also, if you kill all the things that can crew Heart, and as is, as we said, you, you strand the Galta in their hand, um, then they're left with... Uh, yeah, I mean, they're left picking up the pieces, basically, and then you can beat them up and however, however you want. So, I mean, I don't know. It sounds like a really cool idea, so... You've got a few more days before the weekend to yeah. test it. Mm-hmm. I might just lock in this um, this more mid rangey list because I've been feeling very comfortable with it. I think I trying to kind of want to try and see if I can fit an Elder Straborn into the sideboard because that seems like the best possible way of doing what the list is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, Elder Straborn is, I think, relatively good against these Esper control decks. Right. They're, so, they're often in situations where they want to like use their Torrential Gear Hulk in combat or slam a Teferi or, or Scarab God on turn 5. Mm-hmm. And uh, Elder Strahd isn't amazing against Scarab God because you don't get to reanimate it eventually. Um, but the tempo you can get from if you have a board and they slam a Scarab God and you go, okay, well Elder Strahd, you sacrifice your Scarab God uh, and then next turn you'll discard a card and the turn for that, if you have, if anything's in the graveyard will get it back. Can like push you towards winning the game I think. Uh, and I think it's also just good against Gearhulk and Teferi. I think you kill the Desperation Scarabs, but you might have a hard time against the I'm going to hold up Negate, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're probably going to have a hard time if they get to seven mana. Sure. Um, and you're, oh, unless you have some big win the game um, mm-hmm. card like Argyle's Bloodfast. Um, but I don't think that you're really planning on getting to on, on like the game going to that stage um, sure. with the deck. Because mm-hmm. you can still play aggressive. You're still playing Scappy's crown is just playing less one drops. The Magma Sprays look real ugly, obviously, in the control matchups, and you're not playing Bomac Courier, but I think that the Khans and this quantity of main deck Chandras um, do shore things up a little bit. And I think you're really stressing the, the black control decks, Vraska's Contempt, between uh, your Scrap Heaps, your Phoenixes, your Chandras, and your Khans. So I think yeah. that's a pretty, pretty cool plan. I think that, yeah, not having Bomat is kind of tough but then you get to play 25 lands and play this mid-rangey mirror breakery kind of uh kind of 75 so yeah. I'm, I'm into it you know i think it's i think it's pretty cool um so yeah well uh this probably will come out after copenhagen so we can probably stick deck lists and stuff that we register in for um for the show i, mean, I also am I'm, I'm pretty okay with just putting deck lists in oh yeah yeah sure i think it was like... less Less that it was more just you know when this episode is going to come out basically I'm not trying to hide the tech or anything like I'm talking sure. about it right now um so I'm thinking about playing this mono green splash blue deck I might end up just playing chain whirlers I'm not really hundred percent decided there but I'm quite keen on the um the blue splash here uh, adjustments from the pro tour list um i saw i saw i've been working with a couple of guys in the game discord that are play on um, sort of getting decks together for the rptq because i do think that um i maybe we should cover that real real quick after this um because green uh, the mono green deck is a, you know a pretty good consideration. i think we can probably leave the rptq to next week unless we get danny on um, that makes sense actually yeah because we've got cause... we've got yeah 
That's, yeah, that's I think true. it's the sort of thing we're going to be really focusing on next week. We've been thinking about it and looking at it, but it's the sort of thing that um, we have another week after Copenhagen until it, so that's okay. okay, I think. No, I think that's a good point. Um, so, changes from the PT lists. Um, moving away from Allosaurus, I played it last night, and it was really, really good in the kind of green mirrors where... You know, size matters, I guess, and that when you size do... matters, and having one of your guys come in and kill one of their guys seems really good. Yeah, it's really good, and um, against Snake when you can kill, you know, just even if it's just like a four three J Light Ranger or the Snake, uh, that's fantastic. So it's also good flood insurance. I think that's one of the reasons that they uh, they wanted to play the card because you're playing eight Dorks. It just kind of gives you something to do with your mana. But I found that with the resilient Kenras, because you're playing four of them. You often just have one kind of kicking about there, or you know, you just end up sinking a lot of mana into Ronus for an alpha. So I don't feel the necessity. I've also missed playing many Galtas because I think that it's the whole point in playing the deck and only playing two Galtas feels a little. Eh, I don't know. I played four last weekend. Um, a lot of us on the run up were playing three, but just you know, if you're going to play this deck. Obviously, there's a risk there where you draw a lot of Galtas, but there's also the times where, you know, you resolve one Galta and then you draw another and, you, you know, you, you feel like you can't lose, um, especially if you've also got a Blossoming Defense or something. There's just way too many Galtas for your opponent to answer. Um, but then the other problem, obviously, comes from the likes of the Settles and the Fumigates. So Commit to Memory is just a fantastic card for that. So still going to be playing that. Uh, also moving away from this, this list had a couple of weird things in it. Like it had a one Verderous Gear Hulk. It was playing a couple of adventurous impulses. Didn't really like that. Um, so I think I'm back on Greenbelt Rampager. I didn't like the Greenbelt that much in the Splash Blacklist without the Servants. So I was only kind of playing two and it was kind of a bit awkward because it was mostly just a three mana, three, four. Um, but with the Servants, it's quite a lot. Yeah, quite a lot better. You still get to do the beastry shenanigans post board, which is quite fun. And uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, outside of that, I'm kind of thinking of trying some spell pierce. Kind of want to. Uh, uh, Nature's Way has been fantastic, so that's not new tech. It's kind of been the, you know, it's <laughs> jokingly called the green searing blaze, but it's uh, it's pretty good in the green mirrors, obviously, and against um, against snake in the mirror, and against the uh, on a green mirror. So, kind of want to load up on those a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, get to play River's Rebuke on the side. Ooh, that's pretty fun. That's pretty hot. Yeah, River's Rebuke's really hot, especially with eight dorks. You get to do some really silly stuff. And uh, in the mirror, that's that's kind of incredible because you end up in these staring contests oh that we've described. And you just bounce <laughs> all their things and kill them. Play Galta, <laughs> uh, your turn. And they're like, oh, okay. Mm, do, do a bunch of things. Put a bunch of nonsense people on the battlefield. Uh, play Galta. Oh, pass. And you're like, okay, I'll tap. Return everything to your hand. Bounce Hit you all for of your 26. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of great. Um, been oh, liking the, that. The, the, the blossoming defense. <laughs> main, um. main, main deck boat's been pretty good. And uh, I kind of want, yeah, want to try a main deck Nissa. There was a 5 0 that was playing it. So yeah, Nissa no, Cruise. Nissa's Steward Developments. That card's blue. I don't, and green. I see. I don't want to play that card. A you lot can of people play it though. You can <laughs> cast it with your land. I know, but this is the thing: is a lot of people look and they're like, "Oh, green blue, you can play. Uh, you can play green blue Nessa." I'm like, "I oh, know. I just, I just want to play five mana Kaladesh Nessa, uh, Vital Force. That that card's fantastic. And with eight dorks, you can um, you can ramp into it pretty easily. Cruise heart. When you crew heart and you make a five five and you go in with both. It's just insane. Dan, you don't actually need to ramp into Green Blue Nissa. You can just play it. She only costs two mana, Dan. I just... <laughs> you can just... cast her for two mana. That's so I'm cheap. Not... <laughs> just on a serious note, I'm not saying I definitely don't want to play that card. I just... I'm just a big fan of Vital Force right now, so that's a card I'm looking at. Maybe Green Blue Nissa makes it into the board somewhere, but yeah. So yeah, that's Mono Green. All the mono decks in this format are just like, I have to play this number of forests or uh, mountains because of my really <laughs> busted triple casting cost, like, three drop. Yeah. But, hmm, how can I, how can I play one other color? <laughs> what if I play two? What if we just played, like, nothing but dual lands? In my Steel Leaf Champion deck. Yeah. 
I'm really not. I yeah. No, in my in my um <laughs> chain weller deck. Yeah, my chain weller deck. These are all bad ideas. Wasn't there a Grixis chain weller list that did well? Oh yeah, there was actually. I'm not saying that's ha! a good idea, but that did I exist. Told you. I, I did it. I, I understood it. I figured it out. I don't think that's point proven, but okay. <laughs> you, you, you win this time. Somebody <laughs> once did well in a tournament. Proof. I mean, I'm not even Total sure if they proof. did well, but okay. Sure. Enough about Grix's chain whirler. Um, okay, I'm onto my blazing volley chain whirler list. I, uh... <laughs> that's the new tech. That's the new hot and spicy ramen that's out there, Dan. Obviously, he played Soul Scum Age and as many deal damage, to, <laughs> deal damage to all my opponent's creatures' effects as possible. Um, I mean, man, sounds... Blazing not a very good card. It's not. It's... So, so why is Chain Waller a good card? <laughs> oh man, it's just Blazing Volley plus a three 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 first strike wouldn't be very good. I wouldn't see constructed play. Are you referring to a comment thread that <laughs> you were reading? Now? I'm 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 I am putting forward my own independent. Uh, authentic ideas. Okay. That Blazing Volley is not a good card, and a three-three first strike wouldn't be a good card. So how is Chain Whirler this good? How I mean, I don't understand when you when you put two cards together <laughs> and discount them by approximately one and a half mana. <laughs> why? Why is it so strong? I don't um, know, man. Oh, we man. may never know. We may never understand. We're just gonna. Just gonna play it until then. <laughs> yeah, that's probably my plan. I really should just revel in how good red is right now. It's gonna be so bad after rotation. Mm-hmm. Gonna yeah. lose Hazaret, Glory Ringer, uh, Karizev, a braid, Bomat Courier, a braid. Oh my god, Shot. red's gonna have nothing. Ma- it's gonna Brown. have lightning strike and chain whirler, and that's it. It's gonna oh, be Phoenix. lightning. St- oh, Phoenix. and Phoenix. Yeah, ah, Phoenix is a big one. Phoenix. Phoenix is really you good. Use Chandra. Yeah, you lose Chandra, you lose Glorybringer. Just have to fight you with fire. You lose it all, them. man. You, you lose just it all. You have to fight with fire them twice. That's how you're going to win. There's no way. I mean, that would be very good. I have only ever cast a fight with fire kicked. Really? I, yeah, I've never cast a fight with fire non kicked in a constructed tournament. I mean, I don't know if that means that your games have been going well, actually, but I mean, it must be I mean, I've won all the ones where I kicked a fight with fire. Okay, cool. <laughs> My opponent played a Lyra, and I looked at my hand. I drew a fight with fire, and I was like, "Oh, well, that makes killing a Lyra easy." And then I read my, and I like looked how much mana I had. I had a Chandra on the table as well, and he just settled the wreckage me the turn before he played the Lyra. Oh right, and I was like, "You make mana." Yeah, I was like, "Oh, huh? Oh, okay. How much? Oh, your level's eight. All right, kill you to death." <laughs> um, and the next game, I kicked two fight with fires, not for lethal because I didn't know I had the second one coming at the time that I cast the first one, so I used it as a wrath. <laughs> um, and then you draw the second one you're like oh. yeah, I was I'm like oh man ultimately punished you now I can't just zero, immediately right? kill my opponent um, you still won that game though right I definitely yeah if you <laughs> if you kick two fight with fires down it's quite hard to lose sure <laughs> so but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this was mono red though right this is mono red yeah, yeah sure. I'm not I see people talking about playing fight with fire in black red which oh. I don't think is a totally crazy idea I don't think the idea so. being that it's um, like the the fact that you actually do get to higher amounts of mana means that the kicked side is actually relevant, mm-hmm. and it's not that much worse than a lesson disintegration. Um, I do find that uh, I don't know. I just really like cut to ribbons. I think that yeah, I'm also the... a fan of cut to ribbons. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about replacing some number of the ones that are in Takimura's list with other things, like replacing the one main deck one with another disintegration. Okay. Um, I think it makes you it puts positions you better against these Gear Hulk um Scarab God lists. Yeah, and maybe less good against the snakes, but you know, we've talked about snake. I think um, it's only marginally less good against Snake. I, yeah, uh, no, I agreed. It's just like, you know, when you're on the you know, when you're on the draw or whatever, you can just kill the snake and stop the shenanigans before getting Yeah, crunched, having but... an, having access to another two mana removal spell is mm-hmm. good. Yep. Uh, and being able to fit it into some turns. Like for example, being able to go like Chandra Uptick cut your thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, is actually quite powerful. But if you're playing because Chandra and Cut played quite well together. If you're playing three main deck Glory Bringer and three main deck Chandra, though, then your matchup's pretty good already. Yeah, that's kind of my thought process. Having access to the one off Cut is powerful, but I think that another disintegration is probably where you want to be. And the two in the sideboard are kind of like I was going to say interesting. There's so many cuts. That's great. It's all cuts. Yeah. Um, that's but, cool. 
Yeah, uh, I forgot what I was talking about originally, but that's um, a good card. I think we talked about playing Fight of Fire in Red Black. Oh, yeah, yeah, that card's okay. Yeah. Probably won't play it, but... Probably not. It's, like, really close. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Copenhagen's exciting. I'm actually going out tomorrow night and doing non-magical things for the last couple of days for the GP on Saturday, which does mean that I kind of need to settle on some stuff tonight. So I think my plan after a recording is to uh, run through some leagues and get a little sleep. So, pretty standard Hooray! fare. Um, but yeah, I think that's a pretty good pretty good place to wrap up. Um, you got any kind of finishing finishing touches? I mean, most of my goof uh, was the last, like, ten minutes. So, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, You're a lot of goof. I mean, man. Oh, I've been doing these, these quizzes okay. of, like... Uh, cards that showed up in like the most top eights and stuff oh, like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. They're actually pretty good and pretty surprising. Uh, in terms of total number to show up in like, in top eights in total, mm-hmm. um, like Grixis is leading the pack pretty hard. Okay. Um, like as a color shot. Yeah. So the most the the most played in top eights card in Magic is Thoughtseize. Oh, that's cool. That's followed by Duress. <laughs> wow, all right. Followed by Lightning Bolt. Right. Followed by Mana Leak. Followed by Counterspell. Crazy. Um, I mean, those are all very good magic cards. And Duress is always in sideboards when it's around. Yeah, and Thoughtseize is always in main decks when it's around. Thoughtseize is just pretty silly. I love that yeah. card. Um... um yeah, but yeah, I don't know, it's interesting to look at the cards that have shown up the most, because yeah. a lot of them are weird mm-hmm. colourless things, and then some of them are just stuff that's been reprinted a lot. Um, a lot of them are fetches, found out. Uh, yeah. I was looking at, and they had, so the, the quiz that um, I was using uh, put all of the, like, sets that it first appeared in. Mm-hmm. It was like a prompt. Okay. Um, and there was a lot of Zendikars, and I was like, man, what was so good in Zendikar? <laughs> like, there hasn't been that many things that have been reprinted from Zendikar, right? Like, what? What was so good that it showed up in 133 total all-time copies in top eights? Avengers and then I Zendikar. typed in Scalding Tarn and was like, oh, that! Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And I just typed in all the rest of the names of the fetches and turns out every <laughs> single one of them has had more than 75 copies in a top eight. That makes sense. There's some cool stats that the... Um, uh, the Elo the person, guy. Yeah, the Elo guy. I can never remember his name. Uh, the logo. Agile v- it's really hard to pronounce um, so he was talking about Scrap Heap Scrounger which has put 24 plus copies in uh, multiple Pro Tour top 8s do you remember that PT Ether Revolt had 31 Scrap Heap Scroungers in it yeah because everyone's playing Mardu that's bananas though Anyway, yeah, like I, that card can definitely go away <laughs> I am super over Scrap Heap Scrounger I, I've had good times with him He's a good buddy, <laughs> but I am I am very ready for him to be gone right. from the format. <laughs> so so they put thirty one yeah, thirty one scrap peeps in Ether Revolt, twenty four in Dominaria. Uh other cards to put um twenty four plus copies in multiple Pro Tour top eights, uh Richardon Port, Grim Monolith, and Wasteland. All of these cards are colourless. Scrap peeps not really colourless, but Scrap heaps, yeah, yeah scrap is not really colorless, yeah. but it's much easier to play than a than like a one black card would be. Yeah, so. for sure. So, yeah, stats. So, different sign off. Anything else? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Not really. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Jason so. Mindsculptor has shown up, has put less copies into top eights than I thought. But then again, uh, he is a four drop, so you don't really <laughs> you don't play like four of him. Did for they sure. play four of him? Did Coldblade play, play four? Um, yeah, no, it did. I played four Jace, uh, four Stoneforge, four... Yeah. Like, it was that makes sense. Cl- yeah. I, I would. If, <laughs> if I was building the deck, I'd play four Jace. Right. I feel very confident saying that in uh, in hindsight. But Teferi's going to beat him long term, right? Maybe. Maybe. Teferi's really good, man. <laughs> Teferi is really good. So, <laughs> thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, wish us luck at Copenhagen. Uh, we've been from the vault, and you've been fantastic. I'm so excited by that sign-up. It makes me so happy. 